All right, we're on, we are on the air. Welcome everybody to tonight's episode of Profound States with your guest host, Mike Beaver. That's me. Uh, tonight, we have a special guest, Brandon LaPierre. Did I say your name properly? LaPierre, yeah, close LaPierre. enough, yeah. Uh, Brandon is a mystic, uh, ET and paranormal experiencer, healer, spiritual teacher, and spiritual transformation coach. He has had uh, spiritual, metaphysical, paranormal, and ET experiences throughout his entire life. He helps people overcome mental, emotional, and spiritual challenges on their path and mentors people to develop their gifts. And his website is www.brandonlapierre.com. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N-L-A-P-I-E-R.com. Welcome tonight to tonight's show. Uh, Brandon. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. It's, uh, being as I only have 80 something, uh, 81 last time I checked, followers. Not everybody will come on the show. It's okay. So yeah. It is happens. what it is. So uh, you're, you're welcome to take as much time as you like to introduce yourself beyond the official introduction if you want to um you know where were you born or you know uh how you got started any anything how, however you want to uh start this party going is as uh, you're welcome to do so oh thank you um well i've i've had a lot of really unique and interesting experiences throughout my life you know if if um, somebody's talking to me, some people that I know that uh, maybe aren't familiar with those, like they might think that you know, I'm just a, an ordinary average guy, and uh, pretty much I am, but I definitely have a different way of thinking about things, and I have different kinds of experiences that's kind of brought me up to the point that I am now. And one person asked, asked me one time, like, well, why is it that you've had all these experiences? What makes you different? And I think that there's a, a couple of different factors there. And one, it's a, it's a matter of what is your what is your mission here? What is your purpose? What are you here for? And that kind of draws those experiences around a person, whatever that is orientated towards. So I've had these paranormal experiences throughout my life as a kid. I I grew up in a house with ghosts. Um, I had clairvoyant dreams. Um, animals were drawn to me. I could communicate with animals. And I could tell them to do things without training them, and they would just do it. The, the animals around the farm that I grew up on. What kind of animals? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, like, I had, <coughs> I had a cat that was pretty, it was a little kitten, but... It would start following me around. I'd tell it to go home, and it would just go home. You know, I, I would tell it to come or to fetch, and it would it would do whatever I asked. Uh, I had a turkey that would follow me around, and I could make a sound. It would come up, and then I I tapped my arm, and it would jump in my arms. You know, I didn't train it to do any of these. I just I asked it to do something in my mind and in my gesture, and and it followed. So whether it would be the turkey or the cat or the dog um, or other other little things like you know animals tend to be drawn to me. Uh, I also have a lot of experiences with with animals in nature, like a bird flying out of the sky and landing on my shoulder, or like a series of birds landing in front of me, because I'm, I'm also very, um, I get messages from nature. So animals speak to me in a way that kind of tells me that there's something I'm needing to look at, or there's an answer to a, a problem that I've been sitting with, and I get this uh, message from nature. Do you consider yourself an animal whisperer? Uh, of sorts, yeah. I mean, I, I can pretty much tell what's going on with animals, and sometimes uh, there are certain animals that listen better than others they hear better like psychically uh and there are ones that are just very in their own stuff just like some people uh but yeah some animals are very very in tune and i can usually shift animals out of whatever state they're in pretty easily if they're upset so i guess that would 
qualifier somewhat of an animal whisperer. Um, so yeah, I, I had these experiences and uh, another aspect of those experiences with my ET experiences, which I didn't really understand until much later, but um, even as a youth, I had friends come over to my house once we got up to the mountains and I would always see these lights moving around in the sky. And there was always these weird mystical things happening around me. Uh, I, I met up with a friend that I knew from back then that I didn't see for like 20 years. And it was one of the things he said is like, man, all this weird stuff always happens around you. And uh, so like the lights in the sky, like seeing weird lights in the woods when we're walking at night down the road, you know, it's a gravel road up in the mountains. So there shouldn't have been any light there, but there was this weird light in the woods. What state, like, what state are we talking? Uh, Washington State. Okay. East so or I, west? I was born in Portland, Oregon, but I grew up in the mountains just across the river, uh, right outside Vancouver. So uh, there's Mount Rainier. Or Larch yeah, I've, I've lived in the area. Okay. So yeah, Larch, Larch Mountain, the, uh, the Washington side, and the direction my window faced was towards uh, Mount Adams. And so I'd always see things in, in the sky kind of above my head, uh, but more towards that direction a little bit. And um, we'd see weird things like lights moving in a triangle shaped pattern, and then they'd separate and do all these zigzags and come back and then start changing colors and spinning again. And these yeah. are the things that my friends would witness with me. And um, I didn't think too much of it uh, for a long time, you know, when I was a kid, but all these w other weird things would happen where I would dream of the future and it would happen, or where I would, I would have these other um, beings show up in the house. And then I, I watched this show with my mom when it came out, it was a communion. And I don't you know mean the, mo the movie version of Whitley's book, the, the movie version of the book. So it was more a Hollywoodized version of the book intended to be more scary. You know, it didn't quite fit the narrative that Whitley was was actually intending, um, but it did its job. It scared the living shit out of me. <laughs> As a kid, I um, I didn't. I shut off this like fear component when it came to movies because I experienced something when I was even younger. My mom was watching a movie. It was a scary movie. And I actually had this nightmare of what was on the movie that she was watching. And I woke up screaming and I didn't realize that until probably 15 years later when I came across that same movie. And I'm like, I had that dream. But it shut something off in me about being scared of these movies. And so I created this. I don't know, barrier or boundary when it came to that stuff. So I wasn't normally scared of movies like a lot of other kids were. But then I came across this movie when she watched it with me and I was really, really scared. What and I remember, was what's that? What movie was it? It was, it was Communion. Oh, Communion, okay. Yeah, yeah. That and Fire in the Sky. That was those two movies that frightened me. And I remember when I was watching it, there was like this automatic response, this automatic thought that came up. It's like, oh, I, I know what this is. They're here again. Like this is this is what they know. I know what this is. This is what they really do. This is what they really do. And I was like, it was almost like I've been fooled into thinking something was OK. And now I'm finding out the truth. And it, that was kind of the feeling, even though I had no recollection of the experiences. And then like a little bit later, and so I was scared. I was, I was having trouble sleeping at night. I, I, I just insomnia. And then um, a little bit later, I woke up and they came in. There was this light coming through the window. This is white blue light. And I woke up in the middle of the night. My heart started pounding and racing. And I was like, I know what this is. They're here again. And uh, I walked out into the living room and there was these three gray aliens riding around my living room in go karts. And um, I I, I just I thought this is really silly. I can't be scared of this. This is just ridiculous. This is silly. Like this is this can't even be real. And I remember one coming up really close to me and it's it the go-kart was through my body. 
So I was like, obviously this can't be real because this go kart is through my body because it came up really close. Right, right. Way. Yeah. It's a fake. It's a, a scene created by their minds. Yeah, but the the whole quote unquote dream was so real. It was just like I was living it up until that point. And so, but I woke up a little bit confused, but the fear was gone. The fear. So really, it was in a dream. So it was in a dream. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't. A but dream. I I didn't know what to make of it back then. You know, I had other experiences too. Where like, so how um, do you know it wasn't a dream? Well, it wasn't until years later. Like I, I kept having these experiences, and it wasn't until years later I came across a Dolores Cannon book, and when I read this book, it sent chills up and down my spine. And I was reading this particular account where this woman was driving behind this huge owl. And this owl's wingspan went across the road. And uh, she didn't think anything of it until she saw in a natural history museum that this owl has been extinct for over a million years. Right. And when she got in regression, hypnotic regression, she saw that it wasn't really an owl, but she was following this orb for like a mile. And it, it made me remember another event that happened to me where I was um, I was a teenager. I was working at Taco Bell, you know, my first job and I was driving home and uh, up in the mountains still is where I lived. And uh, crossing the road was this huge porcupine and its quills came up past the hood of the car. I remember I could even like remember it thinking that I could hear the quills as it was rocking back and forth, moving across the road. And I sat there and looked, I'm like, that's a huge porcupine. I've never seen one that big. That's a huge porcupine. And I spaced out and I looked again and it was gone. And I was like, oh, that was so weird. You know, like what just happened? And I drove home and I told my mom the next day, I'm like, mom, I saw this huge porcupine. She's like, no, you didn't. I'm like, no, it was, this, it came across like this big. It was like this high up past the hood. She's like, no, that's impossible. I don't know what you saw, but it wasn't a porcupine. She grabbed this book. She's like, they only get like a foot tall, like quills and all. This is like, that's an adult. I'm like, oh, oh, I didn't know that. I, I don't know what I saw though. So it brought that memory to mind. And when I went and got a regression, um, What's that? Who, was your, who, who did your regression? I, I don't remember the name of the person. Uh, it was someone local in Portland. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, uh, but both of those experiences were different than they appeared to be, right? And so um, the first one, it wasn't, it, everything was exactly the same up until I got to the hallway and there was they weren't in go-karts. They were actually just standing right in front of me and there was three of them still but one in front of me standing about where it came up and appeared to drive up towards and then drove away it was standing about that far away and there was two others on each side and they touched my shoulders and i blacked out and floated up how tall were they uh the typical gray four feet high around there and the the face uh the, did they have wraparound eyes or brown eyes or what what Describe their facial features in their eyes, and their nose and mouth and stuff. Oh, it was the big black eyes, the big, huge, almond tilted black eyes, slit for mouth, uh, little nose. I mean, little little dots for nose, not really a nose, but more just the slits. Um, wiry, thin, wiry body. Did the eyes wrap around the head or were they just in the... You know, just in the front, or did they go around to the sides, sort of thing? Uh, it it wasn't really a wrap around. It was more like they have a like a large head, and it was, I don't know. I guess it, the way it was, it might be not exactly totally in front like ours, but not necessarily wrap around. But um, go ahead with the story. I don't mean to interrupt you. So there was those beings which have had a lot of interactions with. Um, after what? that. Well, what did they do? Go through that same, the one experience, the first experience, go through it like you were there, like you're there now. Uh, the only, it came I mean, up, it was during the aggression. You only picked it up during the regret, the true part of it during the regression, yeah. right? Well, basically, I, I already said as much as I remembered in regression. And then, oh, we moved really? But yeah, so it was, they were in front of me and 
uh, I was frightened. My heart started racing. I saw them right in front of me. And at that point, they were like not much taller than me. You know, they were around the same height. They were like, so I'm looking at them. And because um, I was just a boy. And when they, on the, the ones on each side of me, touched my arm, I calmed down. I instantly calmed down. And then there is a sensation where I started blacking out and then floating up. So I don't know if we like floated up through the roof or or what, but I, I floated up and then I was somewhere else. And the details after that were kind of hazy. I, I, could, I can't recall with clarity like the details after that. But we moved on to another scene and that was like the, the porcupine scene. And that was actually a different type of being. So unlike the other ones where you had these big black eyes, there were huge eyes, but they had pupils and an iris. And there was like whites around that. It was very, this very intelligent, wise, majestic quality to these eyes. And the skin wasn't completely smooth like the other grays. Um, it was more wrinkly, but still like no clothes. Uh, but di yeah, different type of skin. And it was just standing there in the road. And I was, I had come up and I stopped my car. This is, a pork is this the porcupine event? This is the porcupine event. Okay. I had stopped my car and I could see it standing in front of me. My, re my headlights reflecting off its body and, and reflecting off its eyes. And then it walked around the car. And it, it's really weird to kind of recall it when I was... Um, in regression because I was in this trance. Like I'm watching it walk around and I'm just completely calm, but I'm just looking at it. And it opened up the door and it touched me and pulled me out. And then again, like I was somewhere else. And I I think at that point uh, in that regression, I remember being on a ship somewhere, but again, I was zoned out and they were they were looking at my body. They were looking at my genetics they were doing some like testing it felt like they were observing and le less so in a connected way like the other ones felt more emotionally connected this one was more like a science a scientist looking at an experiment with not complete disregard but less connection so they were caring and wise, but they were like, um, I guess, just checking in on the experiment kind of felt like. Um, and I haven't seen those ones since. Uh, after that, I started getting a lot more experiences. I also saw shadow being when I was young, too. Um, and that one was kind of woke me up in the middle of the night just got drawn to look in the hallway like something jolted me out of a deep sleep and there's a shadow being walking down the hallway it scared me so bad that I couldn't even breathe I was like literally petrified and my I couldn't even blink I couldn't move all the hair in my body was standing up and um so I'm sitting there looking at the hallway and then like a couple minutes like it walk it stares at me for a while and then it looks forward and it seems like forever, and then it walks forward. And the only thing down the end of the hall was my brother's room. So I'm, I'm trying to muster up all the courage I could, and I like start breathing. <laughs> okay, okay. And I jump out of bed. I turn on all the lights. I get to the hallway. I turn on the lights. I jump in my brother's brother's room, and I turn on his lights. And he's like, "What?" I'm like, "Do were you just out of your bed?" He's like, "No." I'm like, "Okay, go back to sleep." And I turn off the light, and I'm looking around. I'm like, it freaked me out. I didn't know what to make of it because I knew my mom and dad. My stepdad, anyways, uh, they're already asleep. They didn't get up. I knew it wasn't them. Nothing else came back out that way. Um, but I how didn't see. How, how old are you at this time? Uh, I think I was even younger at that time, and I might have been eight. Yeah, it was eight or ten, somewhere around there. I think it was eight, though. I think so that time. Was eight. How well? Um... Hold on. So, what's the earliest memory you have of any alien contact? At what age? Well, 
I think that shadow being was the first time I had like an awareness that there was something, a being there, but I didn't know what it was. You know? so that was your first paranormal event? No, no, not the first paranormal event. Like prior to that, um, when I was way li more little even, uh, there was ghosts, like I think I was six and there was ghosts in the house when I was six. And they would come up the stairs. I could hear them, dunk, 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 dunk. And I could see the shadows move at night. So there were spirits in the attic where I was living that the house was haunted. And in that house, I would always have dreams of, I had dreams I knew it was connected to the spirit of me dying in Vietnam. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a boy, but I'm having these dreams of dying in Vietnam. So you think that was your past life? Uh, I think it was that spirit that was in the house. Oh, so you were picking up his thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm an empath, so I definitely pick up other people's thoughts and emotions. I didn't know that's what was going on uh, necessarily all the time, but I, I knew back then that my dream was the ghost. I knew it was the spirit. I knew it was connected to the spirit. I could, I could just feel it. So... And then prior to that, even even more young, you know, having dreams of what's on the TV when I was asleep, um, having what was another one. There was little little things here and there when I was was little, but uh, that indicated some something else. Some other things were going on, you know, other other little paranormal experiences. The ET thing, though, like the shadow being, I didn't even know what it was, but I had another shadow being experience when I was in Iraq. So I was in the military. I was in the Marine Corps. Um, I did have some things happen while I was in the Marine Corps. What was your MOS? Uh, 6317, so aviation, um, avionics on F-18s. Oh, so you're an electronic tech? Yeah. Yeah. Specializing in aviation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. F-18s. Uh, okay. So uh, going, with the, going with your, uh, I cut you off. Please, oh. please uh, continue. Um, well, so I, I, I did about uh, five years in the Marine Corps. I had some things happen while I was in. Um, but when I got out, I did contracting work. I was fixing night vision cameras. Um, so same type of flare that we used to install on the aircraft, except now I'm putting on blimps and, and towers to do perimeter security over in Iraq. So I'm a contractor over there. And, and over there, I had a, a shadow being appear in my room. And I, uh, I was working on my psychic gifts. You know, so my mom is psychic. Um, my grandma had some gifts too. Uh, my father is Native American, and uh, he had stuff happen too around him, but it kind of freaked him out. It was always like, whenever um, when he was still alive, you know, he would tell my mom, "Is like, oh, that's spooky shit." <laughs> so it freaked him out. Um, but yeah, there, there's stuff that happened on both sides. And uh, so over there, I started working on some of my gifts. I I worked on my telepathy and I found that I could speak to people kind of like the same way I did the animals, but I got it with such clarity that if they weren't looking at me, they would respond verbally. And it got that way because the whole time I was over there, I was practicing, so to speak, with my mom because she was worried about me perpetually. So she would psychically tap in. She's like, I'm worried about you. I, I need you to call me. And I would hear her. I would feel her. And I'd go to the phone area to call her and she's like, oh, you got my message. Or I would send her a message, hey, I'm gonna call you soon. And she would know to go home and she would walk right in the door the moment I call her. Right? So we had this connection where I always knew what was going on with her. So I was working on my gifts. Um, I got really good at telepathy. Um, I uh, started playing around with manifestation and so I, I, I made some incredible things happen with manifestation because I, I just had time and energy and uh, 
to spare because I, I, I didn't work a whole lot over there. I had a lot of free time. So it was only when anything was broken or I had to install or dismantle something or teach the soldiers how to use the equipment. Uh, so there was a lot of free time. How did, met, how, did, how did you get started with manifesting? What got you on that particular area? That where you? How did you begin? Even think about starting to manifest, and what did you do? What it? What things did you do to begin your manifestation? To 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 make it work. So, it was when the secret came out. That movie, The Secret. Yes. And I had, I believe, I was already out of the military by then. Um, I'm, yes, I had to have been out. So I was living in that house. So I was still down in San Diego. And I remember walking by the stand and there wasn't a whole lot of advertising on what that was. It was just the stand full of movies and it said The Secret. And I looked over to my friend. I'm like, I don't know what that is. I only know that I need to get it. And he's like, okay. You know, so I got it. And it was something that like, um, definitely out of the realm of what he was used to, to listening to. But we sat there and I must have watched that movie like 30 times. And I started to think about a lot of the things in my life and how they have come about. And uh, I used to get in a lot of fights. You know, ever since I was young, I used to get in a lot of fights. And I remember like at that point, I had uh, gotten a bar fight already i think it was after the fact of getting this bar fight and breaking my leg or my leg was broken for me i should say and splintered pretty bad i thought i was barred my leg after but i i always had this energy that i carried of needing to defend myself or being prepared to defend myself and because i had this energy like stuff always happened around me or or happened to people that I cared about around me and I would have to step in to defend them. And so what I realized after like really being introspective and watching that movie, it was me carrying this energy of needing to be prepared to defend myself that brought about the situations that I actually uh, called for me to defend myself. So I started to release this need to defend myself release the energy that I carried there and uh, things stopped happening. I stopped getting in fights. And that was really the introduction to things as far as manifestation goes. And then I came across some other literature that I looked at and well, that's really interesting. When I got over to Iraq because I was, I was meditating all the time and I was uh, sitting and reflecting on some things. I'm like, well, if this is true, what else can I do? If everything really is about the mind and consciousness, then I should be able to create these different outcomes. Um, and I, because I also started looking at quantum physics, I started looking at like string theory and M theory and these different aspects in quantum physics. And as it relates to consciousness, thinking about how reality is created and how these things work. So, and I started get really getting into that when I was over there. I started dipping in a little bit, but really getting into it about when I was over there. Um, and so I started like, like, okay, well, let's play with this. And like one time I, I needed a new office chair. I had a, a leather chair, uh, but the wheel was broken. You know, I had a, a pretty nice setup in this tent. I built my own room. I had this like track lighting around the room. I could change the the lighting setting and for Iraq, that's that's pretty nice. I had a large big screen TV that I would put like uh, this Blu-ray fish tank on. It's kind of like make me feel relaxed and peaceful. And but then I really wanted an office chair for this desk that I built. And so I was like, OK, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to imagine and see myself getting a new chair. And so I could feel it. I could see it. I could sense it. I need I had this new chair. Uh, I just really needed the wheels, but I, I was just focusing on me getting that. And then I went around and I drove around the whole base. And a lot of times when people are moving, moving out and going home, they leave their stuff outside. So somebody else can come pick it up that finds it useful. So um, I look around and there's nothing and I go back home I'm like, well, OK, it's not right now, maybe later. 
And then I just let it go. And I'm like, I'm laying down and I start to go into meditation and I get this ringing in my ear, uh, like often happens when I get messages. And this voice came in and said, go look for your chair. Okay. So I get out, uh, get in my little uh, Polaris to drive around the base looking for my chair, drive around the whole base, didn't find nothing. I'm like, oh man, so let me, I guess I'll, I'll go back and stop by this other compound part of the company that I work for a different division and see what they're up to. And then I pulled in there and he's like, well, what are you doing? I'm like, well, I was just driving around the base looking for a new chair, but I didn't find anything. And he's like, oh, we just got a shipment in. go grab yourself one before they're gone. I'm like, okay. So I went and grabbed a new chair and, and then uh, got back to the uh, place I was staying. And I actually traded the new chair with somebody else's old chair. Uh, because I actually like my chair better. I just needed the wheels. So I took the wheels off of his and gave him the brand new chair. I was like, well, there's something to this. And so I started using it again. I was going to go home on leave. <clears throat> and going home on leave, I was like, well, I want to go home and get out of town, out of, out of country. Uh, I had five days to leave the country. If I leave in two days, it means I have three extra days off the books. You know, I can be home three extra days. And so I was uh, focusing on myself flying out of the country like Superman and landing in San Diego and la landing down in the States like, man, and I, the feeling I, and the sentence was like, man, I got here fast. I made it. Man, I got here fast. Wow. I got three extra days. And I kept repeating that and feeling and seeing myself fly and then land in just one big swoop like Superman would. And uh, so this was another interesting like teaching for me because it was more of a parts manifestation and a, a, and a teaching on resilience in your alignment. And it's much easier, of course, when there's no emotional attachment and it doesn't really matter that much. But at the same time, you re remain resilient towards your projected outcome. So I knew that I had to take a certain route out of town. I also knew that I hated wearing the body armor um, and the plates they make you put in there because it's an extra 60 pounds. I wasn't concerned about my safety because I knew I'd be OK no matter what. And I didn't really want to fly on the commercial airplane with this extra 60 pounds of plates uh, in addition to my vest and my helmet. So I'm like, I'm going to leave it at home and I'm going to avoid this one base that has a metal detector because they're looking for explosives and weapons and things. But they're also making sure that you have your plates that when you get on the helicopter that you're you're safe. I was like, OK, I'm, I'm just going to avoid that. I'm going to leave that at home. I'm going to take this route. I'm going to get home really fast. And that was my intention. And so I, I get on the helicopter in the first leg and um, we're in the air. And I've already practiced like my telepathy at this point. So I knew that afterwards, I'm gonna go, he probably heard me at some level at least. But uh, he, re he re leans back and said, we gotta land. The helicopter's broken, we gotta land. I'm like, oh shit. So then I start going back into my manifesting. Uh, and I'm like, nope, nope, helicopter's not broken. Everything's fine, we are fine. Helicopter's okay. And he leans back again, almost like he heard me. And he's like, it's not our helicopter, it's the other one, but we're gonna land. I'm like, okay, I just let that go. I'm like, all right, so we're good. Uh, we land and he's going by like, everybody is like, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? And he's like, okay, well, you're, go you're leaving in an hour, you're leaving tomorrow. And the guy next to me is like, you're leaving in an hour. And he pointed to me, you're leaving tomorrow. The guy looks at me, he's like, ha, I'm like, uh, we'll see. And so he goes through the line and I go back inwards. I'm like, no, everything's fine. Everything is fine. I'm still going to leave on time. I'm going to get there and I'm going to land like Superman. So I just kept refer uh, repeating and affirming my manifestation, re affirming what I already knew to be true. That's the feeling, the visual, what I'm creating. I knew that to be more true than the reality I was experiencing. So he goes away and he comes back like 20 minutes later. He's like, change of plan. You're leaving in an hour, you're leaving tomorrow. I look at him and go, ha. He <laughs> was like, oh, damn it. So I get up, I get end up getting on the flight. We start going. He's like, we're gonna divert the uh, the flight pan though. 
So we're going to this base instead. I'm like, oh man, it was the one I was trying to avoid. So I'm like, you know, it's worked this far. So I'm going to stick to what I'm doing. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. I'm going to land exactly feel like, oh, I made it. I got three extra days, man. I got here fast. So we get there and I just have this really calm, peaceful, knowing, accepting feeling. And we're we're walking uh, in line, getting up there. And the guy in front of me takes off his vest, puts it down on the belt. It goes through the metal detector just fine. And then I'm next. The moment I walk up to the machine, it broke. The power goes off, it goes hit. He starts hitting it. He's like, well, that's never happened. That's weird. I'm like, hmm, I don't know. And he's like, well, do you have any uh, explosives, knives, guns, ammo? Nope. All right, you can go. So he let me go. So everything that I was manifesting, like it happened exactly like I intended it to. And all along the way, there was, there was these seemingly obstacles. But because I was resilient in my manifestation, it still happened regardless. Everything realigned itself to what I was intending. So that's really how I started into manifestation. I learned a lot more since then about like uh, attachments and emotional factors. Over there, I had none. You know, I was making really good money. I had nothing to worry about. It was just all experimentation and play. Um, also in Iraq is when I I had my first like intentional healing. Well, intentional. It just kind of happened. It was a spontaneous healing uh, because of this bond that I that I had with my mom. Um, she and that tele telepathic nature that we we developed. I uh, I started to feel that she was very depressed. I knew right then that she was suicidal. I also knew that if I didn't do something that she would kill herself. And I didn't know exactly um, what I would do. And I was just searching for something. The first thing I came across was just like this overpriced Reiki healer. So I'm like, well, she must know what she's doing. I, I, I've never tried this stuff before. Um, yeah, there's, there's something to it. So I'll, I'll give it a shot. And then everything I knew about consciousness and, and quantum physics, I'm like, there's got to be something to this. Like, and I've read a book before that, too, about somebody else that did some type of healing. I'm like, there's got to be something to this. And uh, so they, she did a healing on my mom. And she's like, well, I don't feel like I want to die today. I'm like, well, that's good. Uh, it's not good enough. But it was kind of like this temporary Band-Aid that I felt. And so I was reaching out to the universe. I'm like, I'll do anything. Just show me what to do. And the next day, I I was taking a shower. And there was this feeling that came over me, this vibration that came over me. And in front of me, there was this hologram of her light body. And I saw these dark spots in her abdomen. And I was guided to rake it out and fill it with light. And I found that I could zoom out. I could zoom out of the whole picture and I could see her house and I, I needed to do healing on the land too. So I was doing healing on the land and I would zoom back in and do some more healing on her. And this whole process lasted, even some of the dog, but I think that was the second day. But this whole process lasted about 20 minutes and it was done. I was like, well, that was really interesting. That was really fascinating. Like, and I tried to get a hold of her to see kind of did you feel something happening? There's this weird thing. I just wanted to share it with her and see what was going on. Um, I couldn't get a hold of her. The next day it happened again, same time. I was taking a shower again, and here's this hologram of her. Guided to do the same thing. So I went through the same process all over again. Saw dark spots, raked them out, um, and it felt even lighter. And this time it felt really good uh, at the completion. It was like it felt complete this time where before it was like how oh, that it felt like it shifted but it wasn't quite done and there was a feeling that went along with it this time and then uh, so so what were the dark spots that you raked out the dark spots were aspects 
in energy, uh, emotion, consciousness. Uh, it's where, and I, I didn't know exactly what it was per se at, at that time. I knew it was like where she carried stuff, stuff that she was carrying. Stuck, stuck like energy. Her. Stuck energy, yeah. And it was, it was the knowing of what it was, the, the rough knowing of what it was, was just given to me in that moment through the, uh, the feeling that I was experiencing, the energy that was guiding me. And uh, the next day it happened again. When that was done, um, a day later, I finally got a hold of her. And she said that she felt these intense waves of energy going over her whole body. And uh, the first time it happened, she passed out for 18 hours. And then she passed out again the second day for 12 hours. And she woke up, all her pain from her fibromyalgia was gone. Her depression was gone. And she said she was the happiest she's been in 15 years. So she was outside doing gardening and all the stuff that she hadn't been able to do with months. So I, I definitely knew there was something to this. Uh, and that's what really got me into doing energy work. So was fibromyalgia the, the only... What else did she know she had besides that? Do you know? Uh, well, at that time, she had a tumor in the brain, uh, degenerative disc, fibromyalgia. Um, growing up, she had some bipolar issues, and they said she was schizophrenic. Uh, later on, I discovered, when I started really understanding the, the dynamics of energy, I looked at her, and I knew it wasn't, schizophrenia but she actually had this negative spirit attached to her i'm like you've got a spirit whispering things in your ear i'm like is it saying this and she's like yeah i'm like is it saying this she's like yeah i'm like all right let's just get rid of that so that cleared her schizophrenia um i also did some work on the tumor so her tumor disappeared um so the the um the attaching spirit did did you clear that and the second one or later than the second? You said you did it, two sessions. That was another time. So it was like a third or fourth. Yeah, that, that was that was another time completely when I started really understanding things. How many uh, how many sessions did you have with your mom altogether? Relative to this all part. Uh, I, I don't know. Because um, it was what, those sessions. Any, quite a few. Quite a few. Because. Uh, there was other aspects later on that even though we cleared them and her health was good for like six months started to come back and that's when i really started to, like why are these things coming back and i under, started to understand the nature of of beliefs and uh thoughts and how you can draw something back in and unless you clear the attachments uh that cause the emotions then uh, they can re-manifest over time. And so I started to understand at that point where some of these things were, because she had a very traumatic childhood. Um, she was kidnapped and trafficked. She was uh, molested, uh, beaten. Uh, she's, um, so she's got a lot of trauma in her history. And part of these, like the tumor in her brain, when I looked into the tumor in her brain, I knew that it was or parts of her had closed those memories off, closed those emotions off. So, I mean, at that time, it was merely just me. Like, I had an idea about something with technology. Like, we can create this thing. And then I also understood I could do it with my mind as well. So, I she had she was sitting there in front of me and i put my hand on hers and all of a sudden i had a hologram pop up of her of her head and then i found i could zoom in kind of like kind of like you do on a touchpad you know you zoom in and then, then there's his brain and i saw this dark spot in her brain and i stuck my hands into it her eyes got really big and she could feel me going into her but she said it felt like my fingers were in her head and I touched that spot and then she started shaking and crying because it was activating those those memories that she had, had blocked off, activating that trauma. And so what I did is I backed out and I, I circled it with light and kind of like programmed that light to slowly penetrate that dark spot over time so it wouldn't be traumatic. 
And then later she went and had an MRI scan of where that tumor was and it wasn't there anymore. So yeah, it was a lot of me like just playing around with things, figuring things out. That's how I started doing the energy work and healing. And so then, how, how long did you work on her before you realized that she had the attaching spirit? Uh, Trying to remember when when I did that. I think it was it was shortly after I came back. It might have been shortly after I came back from Iraq. Or maybe it was I, I don't remember exactly. I remember talking with her on the phone about it. I'm like, do you still have that? Because like she stopped taking the medication, but then she would get these like muffled whispers. And, uh, and I started learning about energy and spirits and things and how these little di different dynamics work. Yeah, I don't I remember exactly how long. Uh, it might have been like a year maybe after that first experience. Because I, I, I didn't know a whole lot. And oftentimes in my life, I have a question. And then I learn through the experience. And so it's just things that that uh, are shown to me and I learned through the experience and, and like wondering how people get possessed and I would have an experience that were I was shown through my experience why why and how that happens but um, so you think it was like a year after you started working on her that you realized she had an attaching spirit yeah and, I think and, so. and how, after you realized that she had one how long did it take you to remove it? A um, couple minutes. And then did it stay gone permanently or did it come back? No, it stayed gone. And what do you what do you know about the attaching spirit? What can you say about it that you remember? It was. I knew it was, it was a human spirit and it was somebody as a disincarnate spirit that was attached to her. But it was human. Yeah, it was, it was a human feeling spirit. And uh, so it wasn't like a demon or anything like that. It was it was a kind of a negative oriented, disincarnated spirit that was attached and following her around. It was, but just all, a, it was just a human. Well, yeah, a, a former human. Well, a ghost, human, whatever. Yeah. Former human, yeah. Yeah. And you, But so, you don't know why it was there or how, you know, like... You never went into the circumstances of how it got attached or the purpose for it being there, why it chose her, or any of that stuff, right? A lot of times what happens when people experience trauma is like a part of them splits, and in that splitting, other things can come in and get attached, so there's room there for attachment. And then when a person has their own uh, negative internal dynamics occurring, there's other things that can take advantage of that. And they will purposely stir up these negative aspects in order to draw energy from it. And so that's kind of what it felt like. It was purposely rallying her up in certain ways and and feeding her like these uh, violent thoughts and suggestions. Um, and she was tormented by it, thinking it was herself, not knowing what was wrong with her. But it was also like using that torment itself to be attached to it. How do you know it was human and not something else? Um, well, it was, how, how, did, how did you experience it where you came to understand this by school? If you close your eyes and you tune into a, a person, you can generally feel what that person feels like. If you close your eyes and tune into a dog, you know that that dog feels a certain way. So it was really like this intuitive knowing and sense about what this overall energetic structure was. And it felt like a person because it felt like it had a name, right? It was a he, it was a male, uh, and there was a name attached to it. And so the, the overall picture just was feeling very human, like intuitively, psychically, empathically.
so do you remember the day you actually removed the human, the male human spirit from your mother? Do you remember the, the, the actual event itself? Yeah, it's pretty much, uh, it, it's really easy to do, removing those kind of things. And the component is uh, very similar in nature, no matter what it is. Um, first, it's you have to take control and ownership of your own energy. And you have to basically command the space. And so it was pretty much just that tuning in. I'm like, oh, you don't belong here. And like separating that from her and then closing off those areas in her that were open and allowing it in. And so I told her, I'm like, oh, you have a spirit attached. Can we get rid of this? Oh, yes, please. You know, so if she had any attachment to having that thing there, then it wouldn't work. If she had any like question about the ability of her to maintain this space, then again, there would be trouble making it work because it's not it's not me that's commanding it. It's me that's intending it. And then I allow that higher consciousness to do all the work after that. So commanding it gone, knowing that the internal higher wisdom after the intention is set, that does the work and so it remains gone. That's why I don't I don't use protection the same way other people do uh, because I think about things in a different way and it works really well um, because I know that my own internal being is the greatest wisdom and has the greatest master of my own space that connection is your connection to creator and so when you tune in that way connected to creator you can ask for anything that you really and really be aligned to and know that it will be done so that's where my protection comes from i don't need to recreate that white light like that some people do as long as i know that i am protected through my my connection to creator Right. And so separating this being was just a matter of fact, like, OK, you don't belong here. Let's separate that and let's really fill you back to yourself. Let's reconnect you back to yourself. And so her awareness was that it that's, doesn't have permission to be there anymore. And then reconnecting, what does that feel like when it's gone? And she's like, I feel so free now. I feel much lighter. Wow, it's amazing. Like I. I, I didn't even know that weight was something outside of myself that was attached to me. So have you done uh, attachment removals with other people besides your mother? Yeah, of course. Um, how many people have you done that for? Oh, I, I don't know. It's like, uh, I don't really count, but it's... Well, relatively speaking, uh, you know, I, ballpark, uh, ball, ballpark, how many... You know, if you had to guess, we're, we're talking 10, 50, 100, you know, just, you know, you, without counting, you, you should have some notion, you know, you know what I'm saying. You've done hundreds or uh, 20 or 30 or thousands, you know, you should have some notion of how many. You do one every week or, you know. No, it's not every week, but, you know, this is... <laughs> I, I don't, it's still a hard, hard thing for me to kind of pinpoint down. I've, I've done a lot of them. I don't, I don't know where it's like 50 or 100 or, or more. But it's uh, become a very common thing for you. I mean, I don't, I don't do it so often that it's like, it, it's like matter, matter of course. To uh, of course, I know that there's things like I'm removing. Oftentimes when i see person continually getting attachments it's, it's not the attachments that need to be moving it's it's a a matter of their consciousness that needs adjusting right and so i i might remove something there temporarily that, that's showing up but it's really like let's let's adjust the part of yourself that's drawing this in let's adjust the part of yourself that views itself as weak Let's reconnect you to your own power so that you know the truth of, of your capabilities and, and how you can really manifest yourself into um, an empowered state, a safe place, you know, into your own light. So 
Um, I I assume that when you have removed spirit attaching spirits from people, that some of the things attached were not human. Yes. Yeah, that's true. And what what were the what were the other? They were not human. What were they? I've I've seen demons. I've definitely seen those. You uh, saw them, or you believe? You know, you felt them, or how did you experience them? You both. know, when they were attached. Both. Okay. Yeah, I've seen them. I've also felt them. You know, there's certain things I uh, I see with my physical eyes, like holographically in the room, and there's other things that like as I'm working on somebody, typically if I'm doing other things, I might be multitasking, so to speak, in my energetic awareness. I know it's this, let's remove this, separate, you know, so I might be doing multiple things at once. Uh, if that's occurring, um, I may not get the focus on whatever that is because it's not necessarily the most important part. Uh, most of the things that like there's other elemental attachments or negative negative entity attachments um, that kind of show up from time to time. Sometimes I've seen things that like mm, they try to stay hidden in the peripheral of the auric field. So I'll look around or and they might move around trying to stay hidden from being seen. So there's things that do that. Um, so uh, yeah, it just depends on what comes up, the way it's presenting, what is actually the causal factor that, that's allowing it to be there. Um, so of all the people you've removed attaching spirits from, you, do you have any idea of uh, how big a percentage were humans and what percentage were demons and you have any notion of that you know of uh, which i assume that most more of them are human and and less of them are something else but i've heard uh just it's, the opposite and i've heard is, all over the place and every, everybody says something different so you don't you don't know who's who's got the right answer i don't think there is any right answer and i'll tell you why about that in a second but uh, that being said, in my experience, it has been the opposite. So um, the the negative human-like spirit, that's kind of a rarity. Uh, more often than not, disincarnate spirits are kind of doing their own thing. They might get attached to somebody on certain circumstances, but most of them cross over. Um, there are far more negative oriented disincarnated spirits that I've come across, like negative oriented spirits that not necessarily human um, entities, so to speak. Some of them never had a body, but there's far uh, more. I, I, need, I need to take my dog out real quick. Can you, can you, are you okay with having a break for a few minutes? Sure. All right, I'll be right back.
You there? Uh. Yeah. All right. Um, so so do you think there people have more demons attached to them or just negative spirits or what what do you think is the predominant attaching spirit for humans uh it's it's more negative entities than demons and it's more negative entities than humans in my experience but i think that there's like a it's also not that simple of a question when you look at like the dynamics of of who we really are, how creation is, um, just how manifestation works, right? So one of the uh, hermetic principles is all is mind, right? And so, uh, and then we can look at other teachers and even our own experiences uh Nivelle Goddard said everything is you pushed out. In other words, everything in your outer world is a manifestation of the inner world. And there has been other experiences where uh, somebody might have been experiencing a what they they thought was a, a ghost haunting them. And it would every time they go to sleep, then they end, they wake up with these scratches on themselves. And then they ended up healing some part of themselves that needed healing, some internal state. And the manifestation of that ghost or phantom stopped occurring. So everything that we're experiencing is also a part of our own creation, right? So even though it looks like it's outside of us, it's also really within ourselves too. And that's also the same reason that somebody might say just the opposite. It's mostly humans that are attached because if their expectations is such that they, that's what they expect to see, that's what they will get around them in their own um, encounters with other people or, or what they have in their own life. So all of those types of truths are relative and they're relative to the observer to the experiencer and so it's it's not a straightforward question in that regard because you can also change your own understanding and intentions that well i'm i'm not going to experience this anymore and it will stop happening so like I said, every, everything is a product of your own internal state of being and expectations. Which is also why so many weird things happen to me because they've happened for so long throughout my life that I just expect weird things to happen and I get these unique, amazing experiences. Um, some of them a little weird. Some can be a little frightening to some people. But for me, it's like I want to know the deeper truths of reality. And so by me asking the questions and being open to the experiences, I get shown different aspects of reality. Um, so that's that's why some of these things happen. As far as like, though, what exactly the right answer is, I don't think there is one just because of the way uh, reality is created. Well, it, it seems like we could uh, go in a lot of different directions from here. What uh... Do you have more alien experiences that you uh, have had? Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead and go through uh, as many of those as you as you feel comfortable talking about. Um, I, I've had a number of them, and let's see. I remember one of the times that I was, uh, well, I'll, I'll say two of them, I guess, unless something else pops up. But I was, I used to keep a, a, a sleeping bag, a tent, bundle of wood in my car at all times. And I knew that, like, well, I might just get this feeling like I need to go camping or I need to go somewhere. And so I just follow that call and that, that instinctual pull. And sometimes when I do that, it means something's supposed to happen there. 
And I, I got one of those. I'm supposed to go to this place. Something's supposed to happen. I didn't know what. Um, so I'm sitting there driving up to Mount St. Helens. And on the way, like me and my kid's mom, she'd already, we'd already split up. Um, but she called me and she like, well, what are you doing? Can you stop by? I want to talk to you about something. I'm like, all right. And then I, so I stopped by and she's like, well, where are you going? I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm on my way to go camping actually. And she's like, can I come? I'm like, I kind of felt like I needed to do it by myself. But then I was like, okay, fine. All right. Yeah, that, that's okay. And so I, I let her come and then, uh, I get up there and, and I, I didn't know it was happening, but I knew that I needed to sleep outside under the stars. Um, and I needed to be able to see what was above me. And so I'm sitting there by the fire and looking up and she's like, well, I'm gonna sleep outside too. I'm like, okay. So she's sleeping kind of next to me. And then we see this huge fireball in the sky and it was probably, uh, say maybe 200 feet above the trees so it's pretty low and it's huge and it's going slow motion and this really long tail and when i'm looking at it i could see people inside people inside this fireball and you know knowing what i know now like was it just being a hologram being projected that it looked like a fireball you know, that's entirely possible because it was going so slow it was, it was super low. And then when I looked at it and I saw these people inside, I could feel, and they looked more like human-esque. Uh, I couldn't tell exactly what the figures were, but I could just see the outlines of the bodies through the, and I'm like, I'm asking her, I'm like, can you see that? She's like, yeah. I'm like, can you see the people inside? She's like, yeah. I'm like, wow. And I felt this transmission, like back and forth between me and this fireball thing that I'm looking at. So something was occurring that was, emitting back and forth like they were downloading from me whatever they wanted and i was getting something from them as well and i didn't know what it was in the morning though um looking in the mirror i had a sunburn but she did not so whatever this transmission was was a radioactive transmission that actually burnt my skin like a sunburn would and it was it was kind of strange. Uh, I didn't know what to make of it. I'm like, is, it, is this normal? Has this happened to anybody else? I, I never heard of anything like that happening. Um, I think it was probably five years later. I maybe you know, six years later, I came across this book. I opened it up and somebody had reported in this book pretty much the same experience that I had where they saw this this fireball thing and then this transmission or if they saw the ship and they got this sunburn from this transmission going back and forth uh so that was another interesting occurrence you know i had a lot of them that like um i i also know they've always been with me for my entire life too and sometimes it's common you know talking to other experiences too when you get a dull moment where like a long period of no interaction with these ets like they're just allowing you to live your life but you kind of get like this like you miss them like what's going on and i feel always connected to them but then there's this thing of like well what why are they not showing up what's what what is that and i i was having this period and i was, I was wondering are they even still around like are they even still like are they just gone like what is what is that and I was, I was having that moment in my life where I was thinking along those lines and I had gone to see a friend and she was having an event at her house, a lot of people there. And then I, I had left and I started coming home and it was like two in the morning. I was driving home and I was just, just getting in the bed. I was like, oh man, I'm tired, long day. And she like texted me. She's like, you need to go outside and look at the moon. It's amazing. And it was one of those blood moons, you know, so it was like a different color. It was a full moon. And I was like, yeah, and I start to get in bed and I get this ringing in my ear again. And this voice just says, go outside. I'm like, oh, OK, I always listen to that voice. So I go outside in the backyard. I look up and there's clouds right above me. I didn't see anything. So I'm like, oh, I got to go in the front yard. So I, I 
walk outside the gate from the back and I go in the front, walk out into the street. And the moment I look up, there's this huge ship that dropped right above me out of the sky. And it's like, Doof! and just for like a second, it was there. And then it just jarred, jarred it off and it was gone. And it was basically a response to my own internal question, my own, my own mind wondering where they had gone, what was occurring. Like I said, like, we're still here. And we're always listening. We're always watching. What shape was the craft? The typical uh, round cylinder, like the round uh, craft thing. You mean like a saucer? The saucer, yeah. Thank you. That was the word for the saucer. Um, I, do you have any missing toe? From that, no. Oh no, period. Ever. Oh yeah, I've I've had missing time where I've been driving on the freeway. And then I ended up like two hours uh, gone, and, and I was like four hours away in the wrong direction. So where were you when you had the miss the two? Was it two hours or four hours? Well, it's like I was two four hours off because I was two hours in the wrong direction. Yeah, but I I don't I don't know what happened. I was driving one way. Well, where then, were you? Huh? Where were I, you when this happened? I was down on, on in California on the five. And what year was it? Uh, that must have been. That was before I went to Iraq. I think that was in two thousand four. So how much time do you think you had missing that for that event? That was like two hours because I, I I couldn't have gotten to where I got to in the amount of time that I did. So you got there too quick. Yeah, I got there too quick. And I was in the wrong direction. Um, so you don't have any onboard experience that you remember, do you? I do. You do? Oh, yeah. well, that's uh, the most interesting uh, experience. This <laughs> Everybody wants to hear the onboard stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, let's see. How many, uh, uh, okay, let me, let me come back. How many times do you remember being on board a craft in your life, relatively speaking? More in hypnosis. Like when I started to get regressed, it was this awareness that even as a baby, I was on this, I was on this craft and I was sitting on the floor, this cold metallic floor, and I was looking at this tall gray being and he was talk, talking telepathically, comforting me, letting me you know everything's going to be okay. Basically, talking about my life experience, what I'm going to, I'm going to be experiencing. He was comforting me because I had some, I don't know, hesitation, anxiety, or something. But he was just, he was just comforting me. And that was in hypnosis, right? And so some people like get a little iffy on the hypnosis thing. They're like, well, is that real? Is it in your mind? And you know, I, I even I had a lot of questions about some things that have happened, but then there's some other experiences that are very physical, uh, with with evidence that I I can't ignore. Um, I've had them appear also when I've been very cognitive and awake and just looking in front of me, and suddenly that they they show up and they're in front of me. So I've had that too. Um, and those were three, another three grave aliens. I don't, it might have been the same ones because they, they, they seem to come in threes. Um, so you've already mentioned two, two races. Uh, I assume both are grays. Yeah. Yeah. And what? How, how many races have you experienced? Well, there's there's the the one for the porcupine that wasn't a typical gray. It was some other. Um, like the biology looks similar in a way because it was a shorter stature, uh, bigger head, but you know, I could see pupils and the skin was wrinkled, so it was similar in some ways, but it definitely wasn't a gray. Uh, the grays have a typical feel to them where their emotions are very limited in range, um, but they get like they get excited and they'll start moving around really fast, but it, it's not the same kind of like typical range of emotions that we feel 
and I, I could feel that in them when they're around. Um, the so what uh, other races have you encountered besides the Greys? There, well, there's the shadow being. Yeah. Which, when I was in Iraq, one appeared in my room, and it said it was like a junior officer in the Galactic Federation. That I, I didn't know what to make of that. Like I, I just like, well, that sounds just really, really crazy. And so I rolled over. I'm like, wait a minute. I had to process what it just said, what he just said. So I thought about it, and I like, I looked back again, and he was gone. Um, so, but that was definitely. This, this was in your bedroom. Yeah, in Iraq. And my bedroom in Iraq, and it was padlocked from the inside. Well, I, I uh, uh, built out the tent that I lived in in Afghanistan, just like yeah. you did in Iraq. Yeah. Yeah, I did the same thing. I, 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 had did my, the whole, I did the whole tent. You know, I didn't build one room. I built the whole tent up. So. Yeah, we had the big Arctic tent, and we each built our own individual rooms. So I built no, myself. No, no, I, I did the whole tent. My, just my... I went and found the uh, the wood and built out the whole tent, everybody's room at one time. Oh, okay. So I, just yeah, asked, we, I just asked everybody what they wanted, and, you know, and uh, provided nobody was arguing, we everybody got what they wanted. We built the main rooms together, but then I, I built up mine, like, the way I wanted it. Yeah, yeah me too. But I uh, actually built uh, um, the bed... Uh, laid on, I, I made it as a, a sensory deprivation tank, and uh, and I could have had I had I had the supplies to line it with, and the the water and the salt and all that stuff. I could have made the sensory deprivation tank out of this tank that I was sleeping on, but I I never got those items to to make it into one. But it was shaped like one with a with a door on the side that you could open and everything. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, go back to your, uh, the, the kind you, of let's see. You've had two gray races and a uh, and a shadow being. What else have you got? Mantis beings. Man, uh, really? Okay, so yeah. you can't skip over any mantis beings. Go ahead and tell us those stories. The uh, the mantis are ones that. Uh, they only came through and like I've had them appear in the consciousness where they've connected to me and I knew they were around or I could feel them around. Uh, but my awareness of them and my own interaction with them really came through in in regression. So I, I, I didn't know about like any more detail or any more up close interactions until it was in regression. Um, the majority of the time, I would have to say it's been the, the grays, the tall grays and the short grays. And then there's been hybrid beings, too, of course. So what did you get from the mantis beings? Well, what kind of energy? What, when you remember, regardless, forget about the fact that you learned it in, in meditation, but uh, just what kind of energy were they positive, negative or neutral or what kind of what did you what feel did you get from them? I I initially didn't know. Um, they, they, they felt more like neutral, but then like uh, there was another time that I was kind of meditating on what what their role with me is, and it it felt like there was aspects of different factions. Like one group would be more oppressive and another group would be more expansive. Um, I, I had an experience that channeling them uh, when I was young and that was came through. It's more of a convoluted kind of story, really. Um, uh, well, please don't skip it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's, let's go back to this other story that I was going to tell. And that was like, uh, let's see. So before I moved in this house, it was a house I lived in before this one. I was getting ready to go down to a conference down in uh, Laughlin, Nevada. It was the, uh, uh, what was the name of that conference? Anyway, one of those UFO conferences. And, um, but 
a month prior to that, I had this dream, quote unquote, dream. And I was on the craft, I was on the ship, and I was naked, and there was this hybrid being on the table, and he was naked. And there was this light coming down on the table. There was pretty much rest around with shadow. And I knew there was a tall gray kind of um, back in the shadow, kind of hiding himself a little bit. And um, I was kind of, I get this like instinctual need to comfort whenever I get in this, like, this weird trance. And um, I don't know why but it just like some things come out naturally. And so I'm sitting there like, don't worry, it's gonna be okay, everything's fine. And like, I had my hand on his shoulder, everything's okay. And then he gets up and he's like, okay, your turn. And it's like this, I suddenly knew where I was. I suddenly knew what was going on. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute, what's going on here? And like, wait a minute, I, I, I wanna know what you're gonna do to me before I get on the table. I knew once I got on the table, I would be paralyzed. I didn't know what would happen, but I knew I would be paralyzed. Like I've laid on that table before. And I just, I just wanted some more like, uh, to be more informed. Like I wanted to, to have like some say in the process, not just like, yeah, do whatever you want to me. So I was like, I'm a sovereign being. I have a right to know. And next thing I know, the next scene was this like chaotic scene and it looked like a dream, but I've learned that there's there's certain things that look like dreams but aren't. So it was like this layer of energy laid over the top of my energy that was really close. And I knew because of that separation between it and me that it wasn't really a dream. It wasn't my dream. But then I woke up and I was like, because of that there, and like it jumped from that scene to the next, and I woke up, I'm like, what just happened? I, I was a little confused. I'm like, was that real? Because it seemed so hyper real. It seemed like real, real. You know, and I was like, what just happened? And so uh, fast forward a month later, I go down to the conference with a friend of mine, and um, we... There's this guy there and he, he's doing these testing and there's like two different guys there that, and both are important piece of me trying to figure out what was going on. Um, but he has this black light at a certain frequency and he's like, I want to scan you. I'm like, OK. And he's looking at my skin and I had all this glowy stuff all over my skin. And he's like, well, judging by the looks of your skin, it looks like you had an interaction, uh, but I'd say it was about a month ago. So he just hit the nail right on the head. He knew exactly when it happened, the, the experience that I had, just by looking at this glowy stuff because it was a little bit faded. And he showed me some other pictures of other people who have had encounters. And sometimes they have symbols written on them with this glowy stuff. And it, Do you it, remember his name? Uh, I don't remember his name. I'd, I have to look back at like former. Could it, could it have been Daryl Sims? Could have been. Or it could it have been, uh, well, it was either him or uh, the only other person I can think of would be um, Dr. Lear's, um, the guy that took over from Dr. Lear, uh, Dr. Lear's assistant, patient 17 with the, uh, the attaching spirit, or the, um, the implant removals, the guy, the 17th, person that, that Dr. Lear removed implants from who actually who uh he he's a um a, a nanotube specialist uh uh he uh is he, he's not doing what Lear did but he uh had implants from one implant removed from him and he he was helping Dr. Lear and he's um continuing sort of along those lines of testing people but mm -hmm. when you did when you mentioned the um the um black lights that was something that daryl sims uh or somebody he knew figured out and i don't think he actually figured it out i think somebody else did but he was the first person i remember coming out with it publicly about the the black light and the the um uh, 
you know, the aliens leaving marks that you could see only under black lights. He was the person that kind of. Um, is, is he a larger, a little bit larger guy with glasses? Oh. Uh, him sounds, it sounds right. But I, well, I the guy, know. the guy that was Dr. Lear's uh, assistant that was patient, his patient 17, that um, goes sort of by the description of what you're talking about is hold on one second uh and i will give you his name uh just a second it'll just take me one second he's he's got a lot of knowledge he's the one that, uh, that tests people that i've never heard of him testing people for the um for the um black light that that seems like dr L or uh Daryl Sims's work. Daryl Sims sounds familiar. I think it must have been it, it might have been him just by um, just by the way you're talking about it, and, and then like the familiarity with the name, because he also had this big book of pictures he's taken of people with the glowing stuff. It was a big book of records of people's arms and things and that glowy stuff. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Okay, so. Uh, Steve Coburn is the, uh, he's kind of heavy set and he does the nanotube. Steve Coburn, he was like patient 17. He was the, like the 17th person. I'm not sure if it's 17 or 15 or something. I think uh, he was patient 17, had an implant removed by Dr. Roger Lear. Uh, Daryl is from Hufan and Houston UFO Network, and he he's the one that kind of uh, got into the uh, black light, you know, where they touch you, you can see it under black light. That's Daryl Sims. Uh, and he uh, dresses like a cowboy in black with a black hat and uh, most of the time. And uh, uh, I, I just pulled up Daryl. It's not Daryl. It must okay. have been. The other guy then it must it was probably steve coburn he's kind of heavy a little heavy set but yeah. he's uh, he was patient 17 and uh he uh got into the black light stuff but go ahead with your story okay so um so yeah so he he's he hits it right on the head like identifying exactly the time it happened because it was you know, it was, it was when my quote unquote dream happened, which wasn't a dream. It was I was there. Um, and then uh, the other thing, too, is you scanned my body for implants uh, with this little metal detector thing. And I had one behind each ear. Stud, then, uh, was it a, uh, a stud finder? The stud finder. Yeah, thank you. It was a stud finder. It was a metal. It sounds detector. like uh, I, it almost sounds like it. Uh, Daryl and Steve combined, but I, you know, I can't pick out which of the two. It's got to be one of those two. But well, he was a heavier set guy, so I mean, yeah, uh, that would be St Steve Coburn. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I had a, I had an implant between behind each ear, and then like one on my wrist, um, and that I was like wanted it another sort of test because it was it was a metal it was a stud finder i was like oh it's a stud finder like but is that is that really picking up what you're thinking it is i'm like and so i started thinking and there was another guy there and he had this um this bio patch that it would absorb electromagnetic frequencies from the body when you're in pain and it would readmit it back to the body as heat and so it would instantly make any pain you're feeling go away. And he developed the technology um, it originally for the military because he was working on um, enhancing antennas. So you would take the antenna frequencies and enhance the field and where you could actually be under, under the ocean and actually admit signals that were able to be received and transmitted. So that's how the technology started. But I started like and I was listening to him, knowing that how the technology works is it absorbs um, EMF. I'm like, well, if it absorbs EMF, it's going to absorb radio frequencies too, which means that any implant I have, it will be able to absorb that as well. 
And so I took his little pad and I put it right over where the implant was supposed to be. And that part of my head got super, super hot. And like it like started cooking my head. I took it off. I'm like, wow, that's that's pretty incredible. And um, a, a friend of mine there also knew she had implants. And I was like, hey, let me try something. She's like, what? And I put that thing over where her implant was. And she's like, holy shit, stop that. <laughs> so it did the same thing to her. But then I did it over to somebody else without the implant. Like I knew they didn't have an implant. Nothing happened. So I, I knew there was something occurring there that we could we could test for. I use that biofield and and the stud finder to do it. But uh, so that that was my physical evidence of like, yes, there's indeed these are not just there's something more happening. Um, anytime you have these weird dreams, they're not just recollections of former occurrences. There's actually something going on there. So where are your implants? Behind each ear and then in my wrist. Yeah, those are the ones I know about. You know about willies, right? About what? Willies. Willies. You know the. Um, you said you saw the movie Communion. Yeah. Willie Strieber. Oh, uh, Whitley Strieber. Yeah. Yeah, that's his. That's his story. So he has one behind his ear still. Mm. That they tried to remove, but it would start moving around when the surgeon tried to remove it, and they couldn't get it out because it moved and so he still got it uh last i heard so uh somebody oh um uh jeff mara who interviewed me said that whitley allowed him to touch the implant behind his ear so he got to touch whitley's willie strieber's implant so I thought wow. that's, we were talking about that you know after he interviewed me and i, I thought that was pretty cool so has anybody touched your implant? Did you let them touch it? <laughs> that sounds a little weird, but no. <laughs> Nobody's ever asked you to touch your implant? Maybe that's my next pickup line, though. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to touch my implant? <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's pretty funny. I had, I had a... Uh, another, well, I had lots more experiences, but another one that's really fascinating to me that um, I had more in regression, but um, I I was with my ex and we were, we would sometimes have the same dream. And uh, after this experience, it made me re really rethink what was actually happening for those um, shared dreams. But so it was the middle of winter. We were living in this house that we had to keep it cold because it was basically a, a non insulated house from the 1900s. So they had newspapers basically in the wall. It was super cold and they had floorboard heating from the 70s. So it didn't really uh, heat very well. And um, so here we are sleeping and it's cold in the room. The blanket was cold to the touch, I remember, when we got in bed. Um, and I started, I was dreaming that I was flying, you know, I'm flying over the tundra in Alaska. I remember like the way the snow had iced over the top, you know, hanging off the trees and it was super deep. And I remember flying up and then down into this tunnel underground. I remember seeing all these like different military um, groups underground it was like a joint military operation and then i i woke up she woke up the exact same time as me i look at her and i'm like oh wow i just had this dream that i was flying and she finished my sentence over alaska i'm like yes yeah and she's like i had the same dream what you know and the fascinating thing at that point i didn't have any more information at that point but is that the blanket that we had, it was a down comforter and it was heated from corner to corner. So it was uniformly hot, hanging over the side of the bed and it was perfect. Like there was normally you sleep through the night where like we moved around a lot. So the blanket would be messed up, it would be wrinkled, but it was perfectly smooth laid over us and hot to the touch from corner to corner, almost like somebody had 
placed us back in bed, heated our blanket, and then laid the blanket over our bodies back to warm us back up. And then we woke up at the same exact time. So it, it was more physical evidence that was really strange. Um, later on, I got hypnotically regressed and this time it wasn't ETs. It was actually, I was on a ship, but I, I didn't see, I kind of got the feeling of, of military coming into our room. And then I was on the ship and we were in this like lethargic zoned out space. I remember flying over Alaska and we were standing there spaced out looking forward and we could see through the side of this ship of whatever we were on. It was like it's transparent metal. And we went up and then down into this tunnel. She didn't remember the tunnel at all. When I asked her, I'm like, do you remember the tunnel? She's like, I don't remember that. She only, when we woke up, she only knew that she was flying over Alaska. I was flying over Alaska and we were having this dream together. This was uh, your girlfriend? Yeah, yeah. It was my, my then partner. So we went up and then down into this tunnel and then we got off and there's the, I remember the different groups, you know, it was the Air Force down there. Uh, it was a joint military operation. So there were the, all, all the groups were down there. The, uh, we got taken off the craft. I got hauled off into one direction and she got hauled off into another direction. And again, we were both in this like, zoned out lethargic state. But yeah, that's an, another strange one that happened. So do you think that particular event was, uh, obviously you don't think it was a dream, but mm -mm. so do you think you were like in the astral realm or how, what do you think you just, I, 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 interviewed some, I interviewed one guy that lived uh, directly above me at one time and he would, when I interviewed him, he started talking about all of his experiences, his dreams. But as we got into it, he started mentioning his brother having the same dream as him. But the difference being that his brother uh, experienced the dream from his angle and he experienced it from a different angle. So it was obvious they were having a common event that was not a dream. But he called them dreams just to be rational, to, to, to basically rationalize it in his mind that you know he was trying to basically tell himself that it wasn't real that it was just dreams and uh, i don't think he actually believed it was dreams and because you know he he said he would be um and this is one of those secrets that uh, some people know about some people don't okay so um he said when he was in between awake and asleep he would uh a gray would grab his foot and pull him out of bed and drag him down the hallway. And that was his dream, being dragged down the hallway. He could feel the wind and everything in his air and his hair. And he said his brother had the same dream, except his brother was watching him being dragged down the hallway. Uh -huh. So there were, it was a, a common dream, but it wasn't a dream. Right. But uh, so anyway, uh, thinking back about what you just called a dream, was it on the astral plane that you were both having a common dream, which was really an astral projection on a different plane? Or how do you how do you how do you fit it all in your mind logically about the one event? I I know it was real, but I say dream because that's how it initially comes off, right? I say quote unquote dream because that's that's how it initially comes off in the recall. Like we wake up like oh uh, that. That seemed like a dream. And oftentimes it's intentional that way, right? Like they, they want you to think it's a dream. In the memory, in, in uh, regression, I was taken into a room and given this like some injection of drugs. And they, they, did, they did something with my, my mind. You know, they were interrogating me or they're trying to program me in some way. Um, so... I, I know it was more than a dream. Obviously, like astral experiences don't usually heat up your blanket, right? So, but I call it a dream just because that's the kind of 
feeling it initially has. And yet, just like the other one with the uh, uh, being on the ship and having those, those markings on me, like I, I know it was real, even though there's a component to it that felt like a dream. Like in, in, in regression on that one, that component that was laid over me um, that was like this seemed like it was a dream. The way the reason it stopped is because I, I suddenly popped out of my my trance state or whatever state I was in when I was on the ship and I started questioning things and I didn't and I didn't fully trust what was going on. I just wanted to be informed and the tall gray came forward and I resisted and I did something and I, I heard him. So there was a, a struggle. And later on, like, like I felt bad about it once I realized like what had happened. And so in order to block that part out of my mind, they they presented it like it was a dream. So um, oftentimes things will be changed for our own benefit when it comes to like military reductions and whatnot. They try to make it seem like a dream so that you just won't remember. Or they, or they try to wipe it out of your mind completely, but there's like some bleed through. So you had some, you had uh, one or more my labs. That's what you're saying. Uh, yeah, I had I've had multiple my lab stuff going on. Like for a year, I had nothing but military dreams and me trying to escape the military. I, I've had a lot of weird stuff uh, occurring throughout the years, as far as that goes. You know, I was in the military, but. Even when I was a kid, there was always military people kind of living by me. They would like give me toys and things. It was just kind of odd. And I, I have to been told by somebody, uh, actually, I was very drawn to cosmic disclosure. And I, like, somebody told me, I think you're part of the secret space program. I'm like, what? I'm like, I don't know. I, I, I'm very skeptical of myself you know, my own experiences, just because some of it seems so out there, even though I've experienced so many different things. And then I had four psychics in one week, all independently tell me, just volunteer this information, because I, I was around a lot of different people at that time. Did you know you're part of the 20 and back? Did you know you're part of the secret space program? Uh, so it, it was seemingly very random, but it was, again, not one of those, like, oddity things that like I, I put the, the question out to the universe and this came my response. So yeah, it wasn't the only experience that I had with that, but I I don't typically talk about that just because they're like, there's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of questions I have myself. There's a lot of pieces that I've put together some, but then there's a lot of pieces that I'm still like uncertain about. So the, the implants that you have behind your ears, how prominent are they? What do you mean? How, how, um, how obvious are they? If could somebody walk up and grab you behind the ear and feel them easily? I if they didn't, if you didn't flip them over, there, <laughs> flip them. Okay. I I wouldn't know they were there unless that that guy with a stud finder pointed them out. Oh, so. I, I had intuitively felt like I think I have implants and then other people have told me like you have some ET implants, like some energy etheric implants and some physical. I'm like, makes sense. I had experiences all my life, so it makes sense. It doesn't surprise me. Uh, but this is a, that was the first time I actually had confirmation because you know, I, I can't feel them. I can't feel anything there. So you, you know, can't you can't feel them. No. Okay, well, his is his is very prominent where you, you can you can actually I think you can see it externally, uh, though I'm not absolutely certain because I haven't been around Whitley. I've I've only met Whitley once, and it was you know I was standing there talking to him for less than less than fifteen minutes or fifteen twenty minutes, but I I've, I don't even know if he knew he had an implant at the time I was talking to him. He, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how far back his knowledge of that implant goes but um you know i i get the impression that his is very obvious um but i don't know that that's the case i could be totally wrong 
So, but you can't tell you've even got, if the guy hadn't pointed it out, you wouldn't even know you had an implant spike there, right? No, no. I mean, I, I kind of felt that I had something, but then it was like, mm, how do I prove that? I don't know. You know so I, what, about, what about the one in your hand? Did, can you tell where that's at? Or did he just show it? He just, it went off with his stud finder. It just went off with a stud finder. Yeah, I tried to start using a stud finder to see if I had any implants. And the stud finders are very tricky uh, devices to use. If if you don't calibrate them just right, they'll go off, you know, constantly for no good reason. And, you know, you'll think you have implants everywhere when you have yeah. none. And once you learn how to calibrate it, then you'll then you won't go off at all. You'll find out you don't have any implants, and you're like, "Oh, I thought I had a bunch, but I don't have any." And I'm not saying I'm not doubting that that you have implants where he told you because he probably knows exactly how to calibrate his stud finder. He's a very uh, if it was Steve Coburn, he's a very knowledgeable, intelligent person. If he's an ex, he claims to be an expert in nanotubes, and if he is, then obviously he's a very intelligent individual he would know how to calibrate his stud finder to make it work right so i don't i don't doubt that he had it working properly when he was testing you know, i'm just giving you my own experience which is you know if you're if you just grab a stud finder and you don't know what you're doing to calibrate it you, it, it will give you a lot of false positives that, that was exactly why i wanted a, a secondary like way of looking and i put that little bio pad over it you know, I, I didn't do that on my wrist, though. I don't remember. I don't remember doing that over my wrist. I only did it over my head, um, and I did it over other people to test it. You know, like does this act the same way with them? Am I just weird? <laughs> you know, it was the same same exact experiences to other people who've been told they knew they had implants behind their ears too. So I do guess, you do you still keep up with the do you still keep up with the lady the girl that you uh, put the the device that gave heat out that you said had implant, the news she had implants. Do, do you still keep up with her? No, I haven't spoken to her in, in a couple of years. And uh, do you have any more alien experiences that you want to divulge at this time? Uh, well, that, those are. I, I have a few more, but those are the, some of the main ones that like. I can, I can talk about right now. Like I, I probably should get going really too. I gotta, I gotta give my kiddo some dinner. Okay. Uh, I very much appreciate you being on the show. And if you want to come back and talk more about implant, uh, implant remove or uh, attaching spirit removals, that's a, that's a big, uh, a big, big interest of mine. Okay. So I would love to talk more about that if you have time in the future. Sure. Uh, and we can catch up on any alien experiences you've had that we didn't go over this time. Okay. Uh, and we can also go over any uh, anything else that you feel, you know, that like, for instance, uh, I haven't asked you, um, you know, do you, as a mystic, do you make your money, your, you make your living as a mystic, or do you do that as a sideline, or how, how does that work? Um, I I do that part-time. I also do other things, too. I'm very entrepreneurial, so I'm all, all over the place. Like, So I, I also do uh, masonry work sometimes. You know, I, I do do different construction things sometimes, but... Um, What's your primary source of income right now? It's probably half and half, you know. It depends. Sometimes I, I feel like doing less of the energy stuff, and so I focus more on like creative, grounded stuff. Sometimes I'll do more of the the spiritual stuff, and then do less of the other stuff. All right. Well, I really do appreciate you being on the show. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, you're welcome to come back when if you feel the urge to have another uh, one or two hour conversation, and we can get. You know, if you want to, uh, oh, uh, are you told?
hold your website. If people want to get uh, in contact with you after the show, would, they, would going through your website be the best way? Yeah, just uh, going going on to my website. I have a little contact page there. Uh, I believe my email is on the website too. Um, but yeah, brandonlapeer.com. Okay. All right, well, uh, once again, I very much appreciate you being on the show and uh, wish you the best with everything and I'll go ahead and stop the recording.